Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All the praises due to Allah, and we ask Allah to send His peace and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. Now, today we're going to launch into a really special topic the miracle of the Quran, the linguistic miracle of the Quran. You see, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us that every single messenger was sent with a convincing miracle. A miracle, when the people saw it and when they observed it, they knew in their hearts, even if they did not profess it with their tongues, they knew in their heart that this was the truth, that this man truly was a prophet of God. So for example, Moses was given the miracle of the parting of the Red Sea. And when Pharaoh saw it, and when the army of Pharaoh was crushed, he knew that Pharaoh was what he claimed to be. Now I believe, he said, in the God of Moses, the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Jesus, he healed the sick. He cured the lepers. He gave sight to the blind. Even the dead were raised by the permission of God. These were the convincing miracles that were given to the prophets who came before. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said, I have been given the Qur'an. I have been given the Qur'an. That is the convincing miracle of the Prophet. And he said, I hope that because of it, more people will enter my religion than any other Prophet. So today, we're going to be discussing the miracle of the Qur'an. This is it. I'm holding in my hand here a miracle. Some of you may say, well, how is it a miracle? If you watched the previous series, you would have got an inkling into how the Qur'an, in terms of its preservation, is truly an amazing thing. But something being amazing doesn't mean it's a miracle. So what do we mean by a miracle exactly? Well, a miracle is something that cannot normally be achieved by natural processes. And a miracle is something quite different from magic. Because, for example, there are things that magicians can do. Like, for example, when Moses went to Pharaoh and the sign that God gave to Moses was his staff. When he threw the staff, it became like a snake. And Pharaoh said, well... I have magicians who can do the same thing. So he called his magicians and he organized a competition between the magicians and Moses. And so the magicians, they managed through their magic to deceive people into thinking that their staves were snakes. So they threw down their staves and they did. They deceived the people into believing that these staves were snakes and it seems as if they were moving. But then... When Moses threw down his staff, it demolished the magic. And the magicians themselves realized that what had taken place was beyond what any magician could accomplish. These magicians were experts. Magic in Egypt at the time had reached a type of an art form. It had reached its peak. And they were in every stratum of society involved with aspects of magic. Even the Egyptian Book of the Dead is a type of magical incantation that is supposed to bring the dead pharaohs and the dead people back to life. But these magicians were astounded. They knew that this was beyond their art. This was beyond their craft. This was beyond their capabilities. What Moses had was from God, and they knew it. For them, it was a convincing miracle. Similarly, in the time of Jesus, the people were very skilled at the time in medicine, and the Jews were very proud of their abilities in the field of medicine. But yet, when Jesus came, giving sight to the blind and curing lepers, even the dead were brought back to life. They knew that this was beyond what any human being could do. This was something that was from God. So how can a book 
the Qur'an. How can this be a miracle on the same level as that? That's what we're going to be examining over the next two episodes of the proof that Islam is the truth. Because that's what we're trying to bring to you. The evidences that can convince any rational, sensible person that Islam is exactly what it claims to be. The divine revelation from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, for the benefit and the guidance of all of mankind. Now, of course, what is noticeable is that each miracle is appropriate for each time and for each place. As I mentioned, you see, the miracle that was given to Moses when his staff became a snake and how it was able to destroy the magic of the magicians was suitable to Egypt at that time because that was what they were impressed by. Similarly, in the time of Jesus, the doctors and the people who were expert in medicine were very impressed. They knew that compared to what their capabilities were at that time, there was no way that they could do those things. They knew that what Jesus had bought was something that was from God. So it was very suitable to that time, to that place. But the Qur'an is for all times. The Qur'an is until the Day of Judgment. And the miracle of the Qur'an is not just one miracle. Its aspect is miraculous in many, many different ways. And certainly, one of the miraculous aspects about the Qur'an are the statements in the Qur'an concerning the natural world concerning things that normally is the realm of scientific investigation. Yet, the Qur'an contains information that no person could possibly have known 1,400 years ago. These are the scientific miracles of the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is guidance, the age of science, just as it was guidance for the age of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. But our topic today is not the scientific miracles in the Qur'an. We're going to be dealing with that in some further episodes. Today, our topic is the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. And in some ways, this is a historical investigation. Although it is still something that is a challenge that stays until this day because the Arabic language is a living language people still speak Arabic people can still pick up the Quran who speak Arabic and read it and understand it and comprehend it even though this book is 1400 years old you would be very hard-pressed in fact I don't even know if there is another book like this in the world today or another language like this in the world today, that is so ancient, yet people still comprehend it, and still people understand its language. So this is something very special about the Qur'an. But what we're going to be investigating is this linguistic miracle of the Qur'an, the challenge of the Qur'an, that was laid down to the Arabs 1,400 years ago. If you do not believe that this book, the Qur'an, is from God, then produce one chapter like it. Just produce one chapter like it. And if you can't do it, and verily you will never be able to do it, then fear the fire, fear the hell fire, whose fuel is men and stones. So this is the challenge of the Qur'an. The challenge was for the Arabs to produce just a chapter like the Qur'an. So I want to really spend a little bit of time explaining the significance of this. And in order to do that, we need to travel back in time and we need to understand something about Arabia in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. May God's peace and blessings be upon him. And we have to understand that this was a time, this was a place with no civilization that we can speak of. It was a real backwater. There was no real civilization there. It was, in fact, a life in Arabia in the time of the Prophet Muhammad was barbaric. We could describe it as barbaric. A common practice was female infanticide. 
they had no roads, no impressive buildings, no amazing infrastructure, no art forms to think of and to talk about. But what they did have, of course, what was in place was the language. They were masters of their language. And if they had a civilization, their civilization was in the language itself. And we're going to talk about that in more detail after the break. Don't leave us. Stay with us for the proof that Islam is the truth, the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And today we're talking about the linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. And we were talking about how the Arabs had no civilization to speak of in terms of monuments and buildings, but they were extremely proud of their language. In fact, the word Arabs use for people who are not Arab is Ajmi. And Ajmi means someone who is dumb. Someone, it's like someone who can't speak. So they were really proud of their language. It was a pure language. It was a strong language. And they were masters of it. They were masters of the use of language. And they were very, very fond of poetry as well. In fact, they had a marketplace for poems, a marketplace for poetry. It was called Uhaz. And this is the context in which I need to place the revelation of the Word of God, the Qur'an. Because it's in this context that the challenge of the Qur'an is made. You see, the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, was not a literate man. He was not a man of letters. He was not known to be a poet or a narrator. That's not what he was known to be. He was known to be honest and truthful and trustworthy. Yet he came with this book, outstanding in its qualities, a masterpiece of literature, unlike which the Arabs had never heard before. And the proof of it, the proof that it was from God to the Arabs, was its eloquence, its mastery of the language, its succinctness. So the Quran made a challenge. The first challenge was, because the people were saying, Muhammad invented the Qur'an. They were claiming he invented it. So, a verse of the Qur'an was revealed. The 52nd chapter of the Qur'an, from ayah 33 to 35. Or do they say, he himself has composed this message? No, but they are not willing to believe. But then, if they consider this Qur'an to be a work of a human being, let them produce something like it, if what they say is true. So the Qur'an is saying, if what you claim is true, if what you say is true, then produce something like the Qur'an. And they were not able to do that. Then Allah said, in the 11th chapter of the Qur'an, in ayahs 13 to 14, again they claiming he forged it, the Qur'an says. So, why don't you bring 10 chapters like it and call anyone you want to aid now this is unheard of by the way when the poets they had to rest if they were given a challenge they had to respond themselves they couldn't call other people to come and help them that was unheard of how could you prove that you are a great poet if you brought other people to help you but the quran says listen all you have to do is produce 10 chapters and you can call all your helpers you can all of you get together and try and produce just 10 chapters like the Qur'an if what you say is true. If it's true that Muhammad invented this Qur'an, then you make 10 chapters like it. And then Allah says, and if they answer not your call, know you that this revelation is sent down with the knowledge of God and that there is no God but He. Won't you now submit yourself in Islam? They were still unable to meet this challenge then Allah made it really easy for them. In the second chapter of the Qur'an, in the verses 23 to 24, and if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to our slave, then produce one chapter like it and call all your helpers that you want other than God if you are true. 
But if you don't, and you will never be able to do it, then fear the fire whose fuel is men and stones prepared for those people who reject faith. This is the challenge of the Qur'an. This is what the Qur'an was saying. If you are not able to produce one chapter and the smallest chapter of the Qur'an, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ سَمِيَ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَا كَالْكَوْثَرِ فَصَلِّي لِرَبِّكَ وَنْهَرِ إِنَّا شَانِيَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْرَتَ Three lines. These masters of the language could not make three lines like the Qur'an. Then Allah foretold that forever people would be unable ever to match the Qur'an. In the 17th chapter, in the 88th ayah, if all of mankind and all the jinn were to come together to produce the like of this Qur'an, they could not produce the like of it even though they were to exert all of their strength in aiding one another. Now someone may say, how is that? What does this mean? Let's examine it. How is it possible for an unlettered, unlearned man, not versed in poetry, to be able to produce a work of unrivaled eloquence and perfect rhetoric so that even the assembled experts and masters of all the forms of poetry in Arabic language were unable to produce the like of its smallest chapter. Indeed, they preferred to fight the Prophet Muhammad. The flower of their nobility were killed. Their trade was devastated. Their reputation was destroyed. How could they choose to do all of this? Rather than just meet that simple challenge, make one chapter like the Qur'an. But they couldn't. They couldn't do it. And it's as a tabri who is a famous person who explained the Qur'an. This is what he said. Some very beautiful words. There can be no doubt that the highest and most resplendent degree of eloquence is that which expresses itself with the greatest clarity, making the intention of the speaker evident and facilitating the hearer's understanding. But when it rises beyond this level of eloquence and transcends what man is capable of, so that none of the servants of God is able to match it, it becomes a proof and a sign of the messengers of the one, the all-powerful. It is then the counterpart of raising the dead and curing the lepers and the blind, themselves proofs and signs for the messengers, because they transcend the realm of the highest attainment of man's medicine and therapy. And he goes on to say, it is obvious, it is obvious that there is no discourse more eloquent, no wisdom more profound, no speech more sublime, no form of expression more noble than this clear discourse and speech with which a single man challenged a people at a time when they were acknowledged masters of the art of oratory and rhetoric and poetry and prose and rhymed prose and soothsay, he reduced their fancy to folly and demonstrated the inadequacy of their logic. He disassociated himself from their religion and summoned them all to follow him, accept his mission, testify to its truth and affirm that he was the messenger sent to them by their Lord. He let them know that the demonstration of the truth of what he said was the proof of the genuineness of his prophethood, the Bayan, Al Bayan, which is the name of the Quran, the clear discourse, Al Hikmah, the wisdom, the Furqan, the criterion between right and wrong, with which he conveyed to them in a language, like their language, in a speech whose meanings confirmed the meaning of their speech. Then he told them they were incapable of bringing anything comparable to even a part of what he bought and that they lacked the power to do this. They all confessed their inability 
voluntarily acknowledging the truth of what he had bought and bore witness to their own insufficiency. Look at this remarkable event. This Quran, this challenge, these people were never able to meet and until today they are not able to meet. Now someone may say, well, maybe someone did write something. Maybe, you know, but it wasn't recorded because after all, history is written by the victors. But that would not be possible if anyone had written something comparable to the Quran, then the message of the Prophet Muhammad would have been destroyed, he would have been humiliated, and no one would have even listened to him. Can we really say that they preferred to fight battles as we described, rather than produce a single chapter like the Quran? Now, in the next episode, we're going to mention some of the historical incidents about those people who heard the Quran at the time of the Prophet and how they reacted to it. But until that time, until next time, let's listen to the words of some Orientalists who have recognized this inimitability of the Quran. So E.H. Palmer, he said in his book, The Quran, the best of Arab writers has never succeeded in producing anything in equal merit to the Quran. That's what he said. He admits it. H. A. R. Gibb, he says, in his book, Islam, a historical survey. And no man in 1500 years has ever played on that deep toned instrument with such power, such boldness, and such range of emotional effect as Muhammad did. As a literary monument, the Quran stands by itself. A production unique to Arab literature and having neither forerunners nor successors. Even those people who are non-Muslim have recognized that truth. I ask you, my dear listeners, my dear viewers, what is your explanation for this? How did this unlettered man produce such eloquence that until today the Arabs have never been able to challenge it? Don't you think that this miracle, this fact, this truth should make you realize that there is indeed only one God worthy of worship, that indeed the Quran is the word of God, that indeed Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the messenger of God. Isn't it about time, my dear viewers, that you said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is truly the messenger of Allah. But this is not the end of the wonders of the Quran. And in future episodes, we will be dealing with more of the miracles of the Quran and the proof that Islam is the truth. Join us for more of those episodes. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Like, for example, when Moses went to Pharaoh and the sign that God gave to Moses was his staff. When he threw the staff, it became like a snake. And Pharaoh said, well, I have magicians who can do the same thing. So he called his magicians and he organized a competition between the magicians and Moses. And so the magicians, they managed through their magic to deceive people into thinking that their staves were snakes. So they threw down their staves, and they did. They deceived the people into believing that these staves were snakes. And it seems as if they were moving right to the blind. Even the dead were raised by the permission of God. These were the convincing miracles that were given to the prophets who came before. But the prophet Muhammad... Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, said, I have been given the Qur'an. I have been given the Qur'an. That is the convincing miracle of the Prophet. And he said, I hope that because of it, more people will enter my religion than any other Prophet. So today, we're going to be discussing the miracle of the Qur'an, a miracle when the people saw it and when they observed it, they knew in their hearts, even if they did not profess it with their tongues, they knew in their heart that this was the truth, that this man truly was a prophet of God. So for example, Moses was given the miracle 
of the parting of the Red Sea. And when Pharaoh saw it, and when the army of Pharaoh was crushed, he knew that Pharaoh was what he claimed to be. Now I believe, he said, in the God of Moses, the Bani Israel, the children of Israel. Jesus, he healed the sick. He cured the lepers. He gave sight. And this is it. I'm holding in my hand here a miracle. Some of you may say, well, how is it a miracle? If you watched the previous series, you would have got an inkling into how the Quran, in terms of its preservation, is truly an amazing thing. But something being amazing doesn't mean it's a miracle. So what do we mean by a miracle exactly? Well, a miracle is something that cannot normally be achieved by natural processes. And a miracle is something quite different from magic. Because, for example, there are things that magicians can do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. All the praises due to Allah. And we ask Allah to send His peace and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. Now, today we're going to launch into a really special topic. The miracle of the Qur'an. The linguistic miracle of the Qur'an. You see, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam told us that every single messenger was sent with a convincing miracle. 